the Hanford site may not be as instantly recognizable as Los Alamos or Hiroshima, but in the world of nuclear history, its legacy is impossible to ignore. Built in secrecy during World War II as part of the Manhattan Project, Hanford was the birthplace of the plutonium used in the Nagasaki bomb and a backbone of Cold War arms production. For decades, it operated as a pillar of American nuclear power, hidden deep in the deserts of southeastern Washington. Today, however, the name Hanford calls to mind something else entirely. Unchecked contamination, neglected health crises, and a cleanup effort so massive it's been labeled the most complex environmental remediation in the United States. What was once a symbol of national defense is now considered the deadliest place in America. The Nuclear Frontier From the moment the Hanford Engineer Works broke ground in 1943, secrecy and urgency defined every action taken on its arid expanse, chosen for its remote location, vast size, and access to the Columbia River for cooling water, the site quickly became home to the B reactor, the first full-scale plutonium production reactor in the world. Within just two years, Hanford was operating three nuclear reactors and three plutonium processing plants, supplying the fissile material for the Trinity test and the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. The town of Richland, once a sleepy agricultural community, transformed into a bustling hub for engineers, construction workers, and scientists. Hanford's purpose was clear, produce as much plutonium as possible, as fast as possible. That mission only intensified during the Cold War, when fears of Soviet expansion prompted the construction of six additional reactors. At its peak, Hanford produced nearly two-thirds of the plutonium in the U.S. nuclear arsenal, roughly 74 tons over four decades. But this breakneck pace came at an enormous cost. Waste disposal methods were poorly understood and haphazardly executed. Radioactive byproducts were flushed into the river, released into the air, and buried with minimal documentation. The risks weren't just theoretical. As early as the 1940s, scientists at the site expressed concern over the scale of radioactive discharges into the Columbia River. Still, military priorities trumped environmental caution. Cooling water contaminated with isotopes like iodine-131 and strontium-90 was routinely dumped back into the river after only a few hours of retention. In some periods, particularly the late 1950s, daily discharges reached an astonishing 20,000 curies of radiation. Even as public tours now showcase preserved reactor buildings and scientific achievements, those working behind the scenes have a different perspective. For many, Hanford represents not scientific triumph, but a ticking time bomb of toxic waste and bureaucratic mismanagement. Generations of nearby residents and Native American tribes have paid the price often with their health, livelihoods, and land. In total, Hanford sprawled across 586 square miles, roughly half the size of Rhode Island. While much of it was fenced off as classified, the radioactive materials did not respect those boundaries. The consequences of this legacy are still unfolding today, buried beneath layers of government red tape and poisoned soil. The Secret History of Contamination For years, the dangers posed by Hanford's waste were largely hidden from the public. What little was known came through fragments, memos, unofficial testimonies, and eventually the confessions of whistleblowers. One of the most alarming revelations came with the declassification of the Green Run in 1986 a deliberate 1949 test that released around 8,000 curies of iodine-131 over two days. Intended to measure Soviet detection capabilities, the test also exposed thousands of unsuspecting civilians to radiation levels far above safety standards. But the Green Run was only the tip of the iceberg. Between 1944 and 1971, an estimated 685,000 curies of iodine 131 alone were released into the environment. Most of it came not from accidents, but from routine operations. In some years, airborne releases reached levels that, had they occurred today, would spark immediate evacuations and national headlines. Instead, they went unreported, with residents unknowingly drinking contaminated water, breathing irradiated dust, 
and eating fish from the polluted Columbia River. Those most vulnerable were often the least protected. Native American tribes such as the Yakima, Umatilla, and Nez Perce, who relied on the river for food and spiritual practices, were disproportionately affected. Radiation spread downstream, contaminating fish that had sustained their communities for generations. According to government data, anyone who ate just over two pounds of Columbia River fish per day at Richland could have received more than 1,300 millirems of radiation per year, far above what is considered safe. Beyond environmental damage, health effects began to surface. By the 1990s, researchers and activists had documented increased rates of thyroid disease, cancer, and birth defects among downwinders, people living east of the site who were exposed to airborne fallout. One pivotal study from the Hanford Health Information Network revealed that residents were exposed to higher radiation doses than previously admitted. In one case, a woman living in Othello, Washington, was found to have received nearly 100 rems of thyroid radiation as a child, almost 100 times the annual exposure limit. The Department of Energy initially denied any link between Hanford operations and health outcomes. Yet, as lawsuits mounted and documents were declassified, a picture of systemic negligence emerged. Ultimately, a mass tort lawsuit involving over 2,000 downwinders was filed. Though many cases were dismissed, a few did result in financial compensation. By 2015, the DOE had paid out over $60 million in legal fees and $7 million in damages. Perhaps the most disturbing part is that much of the contamination was never properly recorded. Records were lost, mislabeled, or never kept in the first place. Workers described burying waste in unlined pits with no oversight. To this day, the true extent of Hanford's contamination remains impossible to fully quantify. A dangerous place to work. While the environmental damage at Hanford has received increased attention in recent years, the human toll on workers remains an ongoing crisis. One of the most infamous incidents occurred in 1976 when Hanford technician Harold McCluskey was exposed to the largest recorded dose of americium after a glove box explosion. He survived only through intensive medical intervention and was dubbed the Atomic Man but his case was far from unique. Since the 1980s, Hanford workers have repeatedly reported health problems after exposure to chemical vapors leaking from underground tanks. These vapors, often invisible and odorless, can contain dangerous compounds like ammonia, mercury, and volatile organics. Symptoms range from headaches and nausea to lung damage and cognitive dysfunction. In one disturbing example, more than 40 workers in 2014 alone became ill after vapor exposure. Among the most vocal victims is Seth Ellingsworth, a former athlete who worked at Hanford until a mysterious inhalation incident left him struggling to breathe. Ellingsworth, just 38 years old, now suffers from chronic respiratory issues and cognitive decline. Speaking out about his condition has come at a cost. He believes the program is designed to make workers feel safe, not actually be safe. Like many others, he claims that the cleanup contractors are more concerned with avoiding liability than protecting employees. Indeed, whistleblowers have often been silenced or fired for raising safety concerns. In 2014, OSHA ordered Hanford to reinstate a contractor who had been terminated after blowing the whistle on workplace hazards. Washington State's Attorney General even announced plans to sue the Department of Energy and its contractors for failing to protect workers from hazardous vapors. The vapor problem is compounded by systemic issues, inconsistent monitoring, lack of protective gear, and a culture that discourages reporting. A 2014 report from the DOE's Savannah River Laboratory concluded that methods used to study vapor releases were inadequate and failed to capture short-term bursts of high toxicity. Despite years of warnings, very little has changed. Even now, some workers report that they are sent into hazardous areas with no knowledge of the risks. Hanford's workforce has long been touted as its greatest asset, skilled, dedicated, and willing to undertake the nation's most dangerous cleanup. But for many of these workers, the price of patriotism has been lifelong illness 
and institutional betrayal. The Impossible Cleanup In 1989, the Hanford site was added to the EPA's Superfund list, launching the largest environmental remediation project in U.S. history. Xerenia, employing over 10,000 workers. Central to the issue are Hanford's 177 aging underground waste tanks, many dating back to the Manhattan Project. At least six tanks are confirmed to be leaking, with one holding 447,000 gallons of radioactive sludge. The transfer of waste to safer double-shelled tanks has been slow due to budget issues. Construction of a waste treatment plant began in 2002, aiming to convert waste into stable glass, but has faced significant delays and escalating costs, now projected to exceed $13.4 billion, with completion pushed to the 2030s. In addition to liquid waste, Hanford contains 25 million cubic feet of solid radioactive waste with significant groundwater contamination threatening the nearby Columbia River. As of 2023, only one of four Superfund designated areas has been cleared from the list. The Department of Energy has implemented various technologies to contain the spread, but challenges remain. Cleanup efforts have created additional hazards, and the project, once estimated to take 30 years, is now expected to continue through at least 2046, with costs potentially exceeding $100 billion. Local communities are left wondering not just when the cleanup will end, but if it will ever succeed. A Town Forever Changed for generations, the people connected to Hanford have lived in its shadow. The Tri-Cities area, Richland, Kennewick, and Pasco, developed around the site, first as a government installation and later as a symbol of American nuclear power. While Hanford provided jobs and a sense of patriotic duty during World War II and the Cold War, it now leaves a legacy of toxic contamination. Richland transformed from a modest farming village into a booming company town, offering workers housing and social services. The community celebrated its nuclear role with events like Atomic Frontier Days and continues to honor this history with a high school team named the Bombers. However, beneath this pride lies a difficult reality. Residents report higher rates of thyroid disease and cancers linked to radiation exposure. Native American tribes, including the Wanapum people, have had their fishing grounds and sacred sites compromised. Access to ancestral lands was denied for decades, impacting their heritage. Despite decades of documented risks, federal agencies have struggled to gain the trust of these communities. Promises of transparency often fall short, and public tours of Hanford's facilities tend to focus on technological achievements, downplaying health impacts. Some, like former worker Seth Ellingsworth, have become vocal advocates against Hanford's safety failures. His experience reflects a pattern of harmed workers being denied care and compensation. Hanford's story is not just about scientific milestones. It is a reminder of the consequences of secrecy and unchecked authority. The legacy of contamination and displacement continues to affect southeastern Washington with repercussions that are still being felt. Now it's time to hear from you. What do you think about the legacy of the Hanford site? Should the government be doing more to support the workers and communities affected by its nuclear past? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below.